It is always an idea that makes the world a better place. Ideas that turn into inventions. And once in a while, inventions bring about something great, something with meaning to all of us, a tool that we cannot live without. And with European integration, it is exactly like that. In principle, a simple but majestic idea. In practice, an invention, a machine that fulfills its promise. As the first climate minister in Dutch history, I've seen its inner workings. And I'll go to Brussels more often than I see my dog at home. And this city, this capital of Europe, never ceases to amaze me in its historical importance. Because we Europeans don't fight each other anymore with weapons. We send our judges to Luxembourg or politicians to Belgium. And they come together in gray carpeted rooms on the suspended ceilings in bleak lightning with a serious shortage of coffee. <laughs> and then we use words, laws, negotiations, patience. We compromise. We sit together in a room until we have a solution. And on a day like today, I'm very conscious of the responsibility of being in the room where it happens, of using power for good, of forging solutions for peace and humanity. Today is the 20th of January. And on this day, in 1942, exactly 82 years ago, 15 Nazi officials came together in a room by the Wannsee, a lake on the outskirts of Berlin. And their meeting lasted less than two hours. And in that time, they used their individual power and responsibility to decide on their final solution. And Europe, as we know it today, was built in response to that trauma, to make war between states materially impossible, to deal with the unspeakable horror and the shame of the genocidal complex of European civil war, to make sure the room where it happens has its power constrained, its morality guided by new layers of European protection. Never again, not as a hollow phrase, but as a practical point of political departure. Pain turned out to be our pathway to our current European Union. And we in the west of Europe have now lived in freedom and peace for almost 80 years. A uniquely long period in history. A privilege. And will it really take another period of violence, destruction and collapse for European countries to realize that we need each other. Are we that short-sighted? That is my greatest fear. How many Europeans remember the lessons of history? For today's young generation, Charles de Gaulle is only an airport, and I would add Robert Schumann just a subway station. <laughs> of the 450 million EU citizens, few would recognize them in a photograph. Konrad Adenauer. Jean Monnet, Simone Veil, Louise Weiss, and all those others who made the European project such a beacon of prosperity and progress. And the fact that the men and women would not be recognized does not seem the main problem to me. In fact, might remain just a specialty for historians. As long as those hundreds of millions of EU citizens continue to experience what Europe means in their daily life, making payments in our strong and stable currency, crossing borders to live, study, work, love, and if you, like me, live on the border, walk your dog into your neighboring country. And also security, comradeship, and brotherhood, they are all within reach. And the Democrats know this. A united Europe is one of the strongest entities in the world. Putin wants to divide and conquer us, and we cannot let that happen. Whatever our differences, we have to stick together. And I say this today because we're on the eve of yet another major battle for Europe. Far-right nationalists are threatening to hollow out the power of our political partnership. Wilders, Meloni, Orban, Le Pen, they're on the rise. And the problem is no longer that they want to damage our union by leaving it. The problem is that they want to stay to break it completely from within. And while the 
physical war is already here, the rhetorical war, the battle in language and ideas, the race between raising hope and sowing fear has not yet half begun. And that's on us, liberal Democrats and progressives. We have to ask ourselves the question, are we doing enough? Everyone in this room, are we telling a story of hope for a better future? Are we appealing to the heart which in politics as in life is so much stronger than the mind? Which conversations are you having with people you disagree with? And I say, we have been falling short. So let's change that today. I will not stand by the side of the road with a sign Watch out for populists. Today is a warning shot. It is time to wake up and I ask you, are you with me? And you, can take those, you can take those signs home for your campaign trail in the upcoming weeks. Ladies and gentlemen, my nephews and nieces, your children, they should be saying to each other in 50 years, wow, 130 years of freedom and, and peace. That is magnificent. And whether they can name the leaders who stood up today, I don't care, as long as they know that Europeans decided to fight for peace, for security, prosperity, and happiness. And that winning every battle begins with this decision. If you want to put French people first, you should put Europe first. If you want to put Italians first, you should put Europe first. And if you want to put Dutch people first, you should always put Europe first. And the evidence of 80 years of an ever closer union is that things have only become better for us. We already have a single market that gives us great prosperity. We have our shared values enshrined in common laws which give people freedom and opportunity. And now the question should be, what is the next good thing we are going to achieve together? And for me, the answer is clear, collective security. We need a European defense ready to protect our own territory. And we've proven we can change quickly. We can be nimble, we can be master improvisers. Because look at what happened after COVID, European economic support and European vaccines. Look at what we did after we were cut off of Russian gas. We came together and we fixed it. And that is exactly the attitude that we need now more than ever, because another crisis is looming right around the corner. Another era of Trump in America. And we should hope that the Democrats stay in power, but make sure that we get our own affairs in order as soon as we can. Because if we stand divided, we're toast. And if we stand together, we can and we will defeat the evil on our borders. And dear friends, peace and security, this is not just about Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Palestine and any other armed conflict. They're also about climate, energy, migration, health, work. And the EU we need right now should be able to answer five big questions, five big questions of our time. First, do you wish for greener industry in a healthier continent than a cleaner country? Then put Europe first. Because if we work together, we can harness the power of the sun in Spain, of water in Scandinavia, and the wind power of our North Seas. We will create funds to mine, develop, and recycle the critical raw materials we so desperately need. And don't forget, this is also the time to heal nature and agriculture. The soul of Europe is not only in our cities, squares, and cathedrals, but also in our forests, our flatlands, and our hills. Local food in a healthy landscape, that is our mission. So there's no time to waste. Let's end the bio-industry and ban all pesticides now. This the second question is, do you want more money at the end of the month? Then put Europe first. Let Europe enforce better paying conditions. 
Let Europe spread childcare as a public good to all of Europe, setting people free and sparking economic growth. We make our own money in Europe. So let's strike fair and green trade deals all around the globe. It's not a time for complacency, but for ambition, not for less, but for more. Third, do you want a digital world based on your values? Then put Europe first. Let's stop building malfunctioning lie detection systems for migrants. Start using AI to make wind turbines perform better. Quit spending public money on algorithms for huge companies, but start using machine learning to map deforestation. Let us use our collective digital power in a positive way. Four, do you have concerns about migration? Put Europe first. The time to make failed deals with dictators is over. Now is the time to build safe and legal routes for those rightfully seeking shelter in Europe. Protect our common European borders so we can keep our inner borders open. And let's be grown-ups. We can each take our fair share of refugees because many hands make light work. And last but most fundamentally, do you want to take away the fear of war? Then put Europe first. Give Europe your blessing in June so we can finally defend ourselves on this great continent. We can only maintain our individual sovereignty if we guard our collective solidarity. We as Europeans spent 240 billion euros on defense. It's the same as the Chinese. It's three times more than the Russians. And yet we're not capable to defend ourselves. And that's an insult to every taxpayer all across Europe, and it has to change. We need a European pillar within the NATO that can operate independently if and when needed. We need a European Minister of Defence. We must... Yeah. Because we must stop shying away from our own potential strength. We are a peace machine that has entered a war operation, so let's act like it. Our new European stability is based on our will to look into the future together as far as we can. I myself call it Europe as our state of being and belonging. And the European project was born out of the courage of its people. We should prove that we can hear each other and every other European, to respond to anxieties of our fellow citizens. The far-right nationalist elite is out of touch for what people want. And liberal Democrats need to stand up and give people a voice. Because 75% of Europeans want to give Ukraine the financial support it needs and not cozy up with the Russian dictator. 77% of Europeans want a common defense and security policy, not a complete denial of the reality of the world. And 85% of Europeans want massive investments in renewable energy, not a complete denial of climate science. Europe gives us power and agency, allows us to deal with fear, gives us hope. And it's our responsibility, each and everyone here in this room, to make that hurt. The Europeans, our political family, must never make the mistake of normalizing the far right. We fight this election to defend liberty against tyranny, democracy against autocracy, stability against chaos. And if we enable and normalize politicians like Le Pen, Orban or Wilders, we corrupt freedom. We taint democracy, we lose our right to speak. And this progressive liberal family, our proud alliance of liberals and Democrats for Europe and the Renew Group in the European Parliament has welcomed our brave Ukrainian brothers and sisters. And I'm grateful a few of them are here today. 
And let us never betray them by collaborating with those who openly admire the Russian dictator that slaughtered their countrymen. Let us be allies, not of oppression, but of liberation. That is who we are. That is our liberal creed. We must win the battle for Europe from June 6 to 9. Our, friend in our friends in Poland have shown us it can be done. So I ask you here in this room, please join us. Staying silent is no longer your ticket to safety and security. Let's reach out to all of those who are worried. Hear their concerns. Talk about Europe's mission to retake control of our own destiny and recognize that being afraid is sometimes part of life. There is no shame in doubt. Even Churchill, Vail, and Delors were not born Europeans, but they became convinced of the idea during their lifetimes. Europe is something you can grasp somewhere in your life to never let go of. And it was certainly the case for François Mitterrand, one of the signatories of the Maastricht Treaty. His campaign ran the optimistic slogan, l'avenir c'est maintenant, l'avenir c'est maintenant. And that is exactly where we are. That is the spirit that we need in the upcoming weeks and months, not to foresee the future, but to invent it, not later, but now. Because the future is now, the Zukunft is yet. El futuro is ahora. The toekomst is new. Or in the words of our European and Ukrainian friends, and I hope I'm going to speak this, say this <laughs> right. My budne vieux zarash. Thank you very much. <laughs>